Hello, my name is Leon Hightower Jr. Or some of you know me online as Leo Hightower. Today in this video, I thought it would be interesting to talk about one of my most favorite, but also one of the most well-known hit or miss games on the Sega Dreamcast, Sonic Shuffle. When it comes to Sonic Shuffle, Sonic Shuffle is one of those games you either played back then on the Sega Dreamcast, or you didn't know that it existed. But then again, if you owned a Sega Dreamcast like I did, you probably didn't know this game even came out back then. I was actually surprised on the Christmas of 2000, the new millennium, that when I was opening up my gifts ranging from clothes and video games, one of the games I got, besides Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, was Sonic Shuffle of all things. I think back then my brother and uh, my aunt got it for me because, well, I was still a major Sonic fan back then and that added to the Sega Dreamcast library of games. Surprisingly, when I looked at it, I didn't even know what to make of the game, especially when I popped it into the Sega Dreamcast and started to play it. It was right then and there I learned it was like Mario Party in a sense. It was a party game featuring Sonic and friends, and when I started playing it, I found it to be pretty enjoyable, believe it or not. But I think it's best that I give you guys my personal opinion of this game. Is Sonic Shuffle worth playing? I'll give you the 411 on this probably underrated or hated game. Sonic Shuffle was released on November the 14th in the year 2000 and developed by Sega, Sonic Team, and amazingly Hudson Soft. Yep, the same publishers who were responsible for publishing various games like the first 6 or 7 Mario Party games and the Bomberman games on GameCube. The game is basically in a sense a Mario Party clone, but it has its own unique gimmicks and quirks and gameplay to boot, with the Sonic characters in it. Is Sonic Shuffle a failed Mario Party clone, or is it a simple, underrated gem that could have done better? Well, in my honest opinion, it's a bit of both, and this is coming from a longtime Sonic fan here, ladies and gentlemen. The game has two playable modes on it. The story mode, which is the main gimmick of this game, and a versus mode, where up to four people can play together. There's also a tutorial mode to help you get into the groove of how the game works, and its nifty mechanics. And last but not least, there's the Sonic Room, which serves as a hub for playing the minigames you played in the game, and looking at various screenshots taken from the game. You can also see some of the other Sonic characters running in the background if you look hard enough, and you can also listen to the soundtrack, or just relax and listen to the music after a nice round of gameplay, but we'll get back to the Sonic Room later on. Believe it or not, this game actually has a story mode in it of all things, and it starts out as follows. Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy Rose are caught upon by a fairy named Lumina Flowlight to help save a mysterious world of dreams called Imaginary World. The opening of the game, when the game starts up, pretty much sums up what is going on and what is going to happen in story mode, where you see Sonic and company are pulled through a strange vortex and brought into Imaginary World, a world made up of the dreams of all the beings in the world and or universe. Lumina Flowlight needs our hero's help to bring back pieces of the power source of Imaginary World, the Precious Stone. Basically, if you want to know what the Precious Stone is, it's a giant crystal that is Imaginary World's source of power. It's also the crystal essence of everyone's dreams in this world, and it is the very essence of Imaginary World's existence. Without the Precious Stone, Imaginary World will go flop. Basically, the Precious Stone is watched over and protected by not just Lumina Flowlight, but also the goddess of Imaginary World, Illumina, in the Temple of Light. In Imaginary World, a world made up of the dreams from all over, the goddess Illumina created Imaginary World and the Precious Stone to maintain the balance of dreams. Both Lumina and Illumina protected the world of dreams and governed it from anything that might cause it harm. However, one day, a mysterious entity by the name of Void suddenly appeared in Imaginary World and shattered the Precious Stone into five pieces, scattering them all over Imaginary World. When the Precious Stone was shattered, Goddess Illumina mysteriously disappeared, and now Void is causing all sorts of trouble all over Imaginary World, and if things continue as they are, Imaginary World will just up and disappear. So it's up to Sonic, Tails, 
Knuckles, and Amy Rose to travel between the different worlds and gather the five missing precious stone pieces. Please, please help me! I need your help! I need to gather the pieces of the precious stone! Hey guys! Yeah! Let's do it! Well, I've got nothing better to do. Hey, leave it to us! We'll help this damsel in distress! I'm Sonic! Hi, I'm Tails! I'm Amy! Nice to meet you! And I'm Knuckles. Thanks, everyone! Okay, everyone! Let's go collect the pieces of the precious stone! I have several questions to ask in regards to this whole entire game. I mean, seriously. Why in the world would this fairy call upon Sonic and friends to help save the world of dreams? Was Knights not available at that time? In fact, this whole entire design is right up Knights' alleyway. Why couldn't Knights be the main focus for this game? Seriously. Or, for that matter, why couldn't this be a game where Knights calls on Sonic and friends to help save Nightopia from Wiseman's rule, who has somehow teamed up with Dr. Eggman to ruin the world of dreams for their own cause and everything like that? Why would this fairy, who is completely random at best, suddenly call on Sonic and friends just to help save this imaginary world of dreams that has the most pathetic n sounding name of all time? Imaginary world? Imaginary world? Really? I just don't get it. In story mode, you choose from either Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, or Amy, and the CPU will take control of the other characters as you progress throughout the story mode. Also, there should be one thing you should know when it comes to selecting characters. Once you select a character, you'll be stuck playing as that character throughout the whole story mode, and there's no changing characters throughout the game in story mode, or when you get to the next board map, so if you're planning on switching characters on the next board map, sorry, you're stuck playing as either Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, or Amy as you progress throughout the story mode, or at least until the game is complete. That, in my opinion, is really stupid. They should have done it like Mario Party, where you could choose to play whoever you want to on either of the board maps, and the game progresses in multiple storylines, and playing as each character will allow you to discover the mystery of who and what Voight truly is, and will come to light, all while leading up to the final part of the story. And I won't spoil anything just yet. But in all seriousness, why in the world would they make it so you couldn't change characters throughout the whole entire story mode? I mean, that's really stupid in my honest opinion. And the fact that you're locked in story mode with the character you selected really, really hurts the game in my honest opinion. This alone makes replaying it really bothersome. But, as you play throughout the game, you'll play across five different board maps, from the beautiful yet frozen beach of the Emerald Coast, to the giant egg carrier inspired airship, the Firebird, to the beautiful yet corrupted Nature Zone, to the out of control riot train, and finally, you play through Illumina's Dream World of Dreams, the final board map, the fourth dimension space. And the overall goal of each board is to collect the most precious stones out of a total of seven throughout each board map. And they're all based on certain jewels. We have Precious Stone Pearl, we have Precious Stone Crystal, Precious Stone Garnet, Precious Stone Sapphire, Precious Stone Amethyst, Precious Stone Diamond, and finally, the main Precious Stone piece, the boss of the board map. After you've completed each world, the chosen character you've picked to play with will confront Void with Lumina in various cutscenes. You'll also encounter Illumina at times as she asks you what is your dream and everything. And as they interrogate him, the chosen character is able to learn about Void and why it is he's doing what he is doing basically, from shattering the precious stone and causing trouble. Then, on the near to last board map, you finally realize the true meaning of what Void is trying to say throughout the whole entire story, because in a way, Void is very cryptic. 
Each character has a different story cutscene of their own, as well as with Lumina, Illumina, and Void. We kind of get to see what the characters' dreams are, and what is it that they dream of doing. And, while they're trying to piece together from their interactions with Void and Lumina, the mystery of who is Void, basically. And, to be frank, after playing through the game, after all this time, especially if you were like me when I first played it, Void really isn't all that evil. And, it seems due to his dark powers, every time he touches the precious stone it shatters. In fact, the guy is pretty depressing to listen to, not to mention, as I said, he's pretty cryptic as well. Lumina keeps beating up on him throughout each cutscene like a total biatch. I mean, seriously, I can understand being angry at the villain for doing something terrible like what Voight did, but damn, I mean, Lumina, what the hell? But in the end, after looking at it now, especially with how many times i played the game, the story mode is pretty okay, and the story and cutscenes are also alright too, for what they are. There is a good lesson to be learned at the end of the game when you clear story mode, and for the most part the cutscenes aren't all that bad. So I'll give the cutscenes a pass and everything, especially looking at this game after all this time, the moral and the story are still good and hold up nicely to this day. With regards to the gameplay, the game plays similar to Mario Party, but with a few differences. If you land on a blue ring space, you get three rings, just like in Mario Party. Land on the red ring space, and you lose three rings, just like in Mario Party. But get this, every time you land on the ring spaces, it multiplies. And the multiplier will increase how many rings you either gain or lose, but you have to watch out. If you land on the ring space over 14 times between everyone else who's playing, then Eggman will show up and shrink one of the ring spaces. So if you land on the minus space of 14 times, Eggman will appear, shrink the minus space, and now you'll actually be getting more rings the more you land on the blue ring spaces. But if you land on the minus spaces, you'll just lose only a few. The same can be said for the blue spaces. If you land on the blue spaces too many times, Eggman will shrink that space and you'll actually gain less rings, but you'll lose a crap ton every time you land on the red ring spaces. So it's best to be careful when doing that. And if you haven't guessed by now, Eggman is basically this game's Bowser. He'll just spoil your gameplay and ruin your fun. However, unlike Mario Party, whenever you move across the board maps and everyone's taking their turn, it won't automatically trigger a mini game. If you want to trigger a mini game, you have to land on the green space with the yellow exclamation mark on it. That's how you either begin a mini game or a mini event. And how you do that, it's completely random. You might get a mini game, you might get a mini event. And also, there is no red or blue team gimmick like it is for Mario Party for the minigames on this game. If you get a 1 vs 2 minigame, your partner might be completely random. Or you might get a 1 vs 3 minigame. Everything is completely random in this game, even the mini events, because there's no roulette selection for the minigames like it is in Mario Party, which is really weird and stupid. Also, it should be noted, when you uh, are playing on versus mode, when you land on the same space as another player, you'll end up triggering a dual minigame where the two of you will battle it out, but we'll get back to that later. Eh, I'll give the game this much. It is interesting to see what the characters are thinking of and what their dreams are, especially when Illumina asks them what their dream is. I think during the uh, cutscene where she shows up asking them what is their dream, and the cutscenes are interesting when, uh, at least when they're confronting Void and whatnot, so I'll give it props for that, maybe. But only that. Seriously. Now let's talk about the way how you traverse the board maps as you play this game. Instead of rolling dice blocks like in Mario Party, you actually use cards to move across the boards. You actually use the cards, and you can choose which direction you want to move with the cards basically. So if you chosen a 5 card, you can move up to 5 spaces and plan your moves out that way. But you have to use the full number of the card you selected, with no exception sadly. 
and when you're moving across the board maps in order to get the precious stone, you have to land directly on it rather than passing over it like in Mario Party, unfortunately, or trade in 20 coins to get the star. No. In order to get the precious stone, you have to battle the monster that the precious stone is based on. For instance, pearl, you battle the pearl monster, or you battle the crystal monster, and so on, basically. There are also specific gimmick spaces you can land on. Like for instance, on Emerald Coast, there is a space where you land on, and a flying dolphin will take you to a random space somewhere on the board. Same goes for the Firebird. For some reason, a forklift will take you to a random space on the board. You never know exactly where you're going to land. And of course in Nature Zone, a trolley bird will take you to another space at random. And on the riot train, a helicopter will take you... As well as having a single player story mode, which is the main gimmick for this game, the game also has a versus mode where you and up to three friends, or for that matter, three CPU AI computer opponents, can battle it out in a free for all and board map of your choosing basically. And you can also choose how many precious stones you want to end the game with basically, or how many you want to collect. So you can technically choose to collect over three or four precious stones and end the game that way. Or you can go all out and end the game by collecting all seven precious stones. It should also be noted, before you begin the versus mode, you have to determine the order in which everyone will be playing. The turn of order, basically. There are three distinctive minigames that you will randomly play to determine who's going to go first. There are a few differences between playing the single player story mode and the versus mode. The overall way you win this game is via the emblems you collect, and you earn emblems at the end of each board map you play, much like the bonus stars in Mario Party. And you earn an emblem for how many precious stones you've collected, to the player who had the most rings, to completing the stage clear minigame, and for completing a hidden quest on the board maps. Also, in versus mode, whoever won the most duels also earns a emblem. And whoever has the most emblems at the end of the game wins the whole game. However, it should be noted that if two people have the same number of precious stones, then the player who has the most rings will be the winner. That's something to remember. Also to note, there are also character specific spaces that certain characters can move across on. For example, Tails can move on the tail space, which will allow him to reach certain areas faster or fly up to certain platforms. Same goes for Amy. With Amy, she can use the hammer space to do the, her traditional hammer jump to get to another part of the map or on a higher ledge, much like Tails. And Knuckles can move across the Knuckles space, which will allow him to climb certain walls and move up a little higher. Basically, everyone except Sonic has a specific space that they can move across on. Sonic just has an interesting little gimmick for when he moves. If you choose the same number card the next turn, Sonic will double his movement and spin dash to the next space. This can be very strategic, as if you select a 5 card on one turn, but you choose another 5 card on your next turn, your movement will actually double, which is a very good gimmick to get ahead or catch up to characters or players that are further ahead than you. You can use the cards to get around and you select from either one of the cards in your hand or your opponent's hand. There are a total of 24 cards in total and you're given 7 cards randomly to start with. The player's own hand is displayed on the screen on the VMU memory card. If you're not using a VMU memory card, then the cards will be displayed on the screen when it's your turn to move. There are 8 cards to select from for the most part, but you're only given 7 in total when you start the game or get a new hand after the deck has been shuffled. The cards are numbered 1 through 6, and there are two specific cards labeled S and finally the Eggman card. The 1 through S cards are used for movement and for battling against the various monsters, but we'll get back to the battles later on. S is basically your rod card, but you can also use it to move up to 7 spaces. You can also use it to steal cards from an opponent or throw away cards with the same number. That way it'll even things out. 
it's a wild card in a sense. However, the Eggman card is one card you don't want to use. No matter how tempted you may be, or if it might be the last card in your hand, the Eggman card is basically this game's equivalent of the Bowser Space, and if you select this card by accident or because it's the only card in your deck, then you have to spin Eggman's Roulette Wheel, and he'll decide on what evil invention he'll use this time. If it lands on a specific number on the Roulette Wheel, you'll have to suffer a specific punishment from him, or he'll do something to mess up your game, basically. This can include from throwing away all your rings, him moving you to a random space, him switching you with another player, or, if you get lucky, he's such a nice guy, he'll give all the players a swap jewel. Okay, you know what? I'm beating a dead horse at this point, ladies and gentlemen, so why don't we just get serious for once and actually talk about this game for real at a much faster speed because at this point I'm just lollygagging. Besides using the cards to move around the board maps and everything, you also have to use them when you land on one of these purple spaces with giant eyes on it. They trigger battle mini games, and the battle mini games have you fight against monsters that are relative to that board map you're on. Like you fight this surfer-like Hawaiian dude in Emerald Coast, or on the Firebird you fight this giant bee with a machine gun on it, and you have to beat the number of cards that they're using. For instance, you have to have a card higher than two or three in order to beat them and it shuffles when you select a card or sorry when you select a card it shuffles from one to that maximum number so for instance say i wanted to use a four card to beat a monster with a two card it'll shuffle from one to four basically one two three four and you have to push the a button on the exact moment you see the card that's higher than the monster or the same number as the monster if you get get it done correctly then uh, the monster will be defeated it did. if you get the same number as the monster it counts as a critical and you trump their card if it lands higher then you win but if it lands lower than you then you lose a good quarter of your rings so yeah got to be careful of that it should also be noted that if you lose against the force jewel monsters or even for that matter the precious stone monsters with no rings whatsoever then get this ladies and gentlemen you have to rest for one whole turn while everyone is allowed to move around freely so it's basically when it comes your turn you lost the last battle and you have no rings you must rest for one whole turn ain't that a bitch but that's not all let's talk about that dual mini game that i keep mentioning you see as i said before every time you land on the same space as your other opponents while traversing the board maps in versus mode you'll end up triggering the dual mini game and the dual mini game is divided into two different rules at random and the rules are the player with the highest total or the lowest total score possible will be the winner one card in particular that you want to keep an eye out for is the Eggman card and the red 4 card is actually a minus 4 card which can affect your score in the game once the game begins all the cards are basically shuffled and you have to choose which cards basically you want to give or send to your opponent depending on the rules the player with the lowest total might want to wait for the Eggman card because the S card will basically double your score depending on which cards you choose so the rules are highest or lowest total keep an eye on the Eggman card and keep an eye on the S cards and the red S cards I mean the red 4 cards because ugh. the dual mini game is just pointless in my honest opinion it was really really pointless and if you lose in the dual mini game just like it is with the battle mini games if you lose you have to rest for one whole turn while everyone else is moving across the board. Jesus! Ain't that a bitch? One other thing that should be noted when it comes to the gameplay in this game. Seriously. I'm using seriously a whole lot. <laughs> but anyway, seriously, seriously. The AI in this game, for the most part, ladies and gentlemen, can be borderline idiotic, they can be normal to play with, or they can be the smartest thing in the whole entire game. And another thing, the AI seems to know which best route to take when it comes to getting the precious stones, 
or they'll automatically know what cards are in your deck. Seriously, even if you choose to reshuffle through the cards and everything like that, so that way you won't the CPU won't be able to get your best cards, they'll still get a good card out of your hand, and you can choose to steal cards from their hands. But I swear to God, the AI is borderline ridiculous in this game, ladies and gentlemen. Seriously. I have only played this game with one person, and it was at least better when you have other people to play with. But against the computer AI? Oh my lord. I'd rather play Mario Party than play through this game again. I mean, seriously. I'd rather play Mario Party than play through Sonic Shuffle ever again. And get this, if you lose on the board map against the CPU, you won't move on to the next board map, ladies and gentlemen. You have to restart the board map all over again. So in order to keep moving on to the next board map, you have to beat the CPU players. A total of, let's see, how many board maps are there? Oh yeah, six at best. You have to beat the CPU a total of six times in order to beat the game which can get very, very repetitive, mind you. Very repetitive. Also, there are certain events on the board maps which will happen after a set period of time as you play through the game. For instance, in Nature Zone, certain pathways will be blocked off by these giant columns, or the columns will fall down and block off certain pathways. In Emerald Coast, a dolphin will destroy parts of the bridge so you won't be able to get across. And even more so, on Firebird, if you land on the ring spaces a multiple number of times, the engines will explode, and if you're on the platform where the rings explode, you lose a multitude number of rings. You can lose up to 10, 20, or even 30 rings. Jesus! This game is practically kicking you in the gonads. It's punishing you for no reason. And even more so, the changes for when the uh, when the certain gimmicks pop up on the board maps is completely random. You never know when it could happen. It could happen after seven turns or after two precious stones have been collected, and vice versa. You never know what's going to happen. So it pays to pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. Oh yeah, one more thing to add insult to injury when it comes to the precious stones and everything like that. A very unfortunate circumstance happens when you are the furthest person away from the precious stone. Wanna know what happens? If this game doesn't kick you in the gonads more than enough, then this should also kick you in the gonads. I mean, seriously, the game is punishing you for being the worst loser in the game. But just watch this cutscene, and you'll see what I mean. This is what happens when... A precious stone has been collected, and the next precious stone is moved over. This happens every time when you play the game. Watch. <laughs> How could the developers possibly put this into the game? Seriously! Eggman drops a 16 ton weight on the person who's the furthest away from the precious stone and you lose a good portion of your rings. Why would they punish the player for losing the hardest? Why would they do that? This game, oh my god. Ah! It's hard to imagine this whole entire thing passed me by when I was a kid back then. I was so impressionable as a kid. Sit me in front of a video game, I play it, I'm good. Put me in front of a TV, I watch whatever was on, and I'm good. A movie? Okay. But looking back at this now, at my age, this game is punishing you for losing. Why in the world is it punishing you for losing? Oh my god! Ah, why in the world would the developers allow this in this game? Hudson Soft, Sega, what were you smoking? Oh my god. Cheez Its and Rice. Ah. The best way how to make the gameplay in this game 
uh, plentiful, especially when you're moving across the board maps, is to get Force Jewels. And Force Jewels are this game's equivalent of items like it is in Mario Party. The only way to get Force Jewels is to play a mini event and hope that you get one in the outcome, play a mini game where there's a Force Jewel up for grab, or battle against a Force Jewel monster on the purple eyed uh, battle spaces. And once you've beaten a monster, you gain a force jewel basically, and what you get is completely random. All the force jewels in this game have positive and negative effects to them, such as being able to use more cards for movement and battle, or being able to uh, increase a person's chances on a roulette wheel for stealing uh, rings or stealing for, uh, precious stones and whatnot, or forcing another player to destroy or use one's force jewel their next turn basically. The force jewels will make the game a little bit more uh, tolerable for most purposes, but one force jewel you never want to get is a carbuncle. A carbuncle is a fairy disguised as a force jewel, and while the carbuncle is in your inventory, it will eat your other force jewels, unfortunately. So if you are planning on using a force jewel your next turn, the carbuncle will probably eat that one. And the only way to get rid of a carbuncle is to let it eat itself. There's no way to get rid of it except let it eat itself. And another thing, when it comes to force jewels, you're limited to at least five force jewels sorry but once you've gone past five you have to d destroy or get rid of one of your force jewels in your inventory in fact some mini events in this game will require you to have force jewels in your inventory in order to progress throughout it if you don't have any force jewels in your inventory during some mini events, then chances are you're going to lose, which is really, really dickish. Also, please note, when playing this game, you do not trigger a mini game when all four players have moved across the board map. In order to trigger a mini game or a mini event, you have to land on the green space with the yellow exclamation mark on it. That's the only way to trigger mini games. Or, every so often on the board map, uh, accident will occur and you play a stage specific mini game depending on the board map you play you will uh, play specific stage uh, mini games like on uh, Emerald Coast uh, Eggman's Sun will pop up out of nowhere and you got to stay out of its intense sunlight with the parasol that's the only way to get the rings that are lined up all around the uh, uh, field also, on Riot Train, you will use ring lassos to uh, grab items from one of the other cars passing by. That's a few examples of some of the mini games that you play on the uh, on this game. Basically, there are a few mini games on Sonic Shuffle that are tolerable to play with, and some can be a little bit fun, especially if you read the instructions properly and you play the mini games, for that matter. Also, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to point this out right here and now in regards to the minigames. I need to get this out there. While the minigames can be fun, they can be challenging or irritating, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to playing the minigames in this game, you can't pause. You cannot pause the minigames for that matter. You can't hit the start button and pause and go to the bathroom or maybe check about something that might be cooking or anything like that. You cannot pause. There's no pause function. Why in the blue moon hell would they not put a pause function for this game? Like I said before, some beta testing really could have helped out for this game. And also it should be noted, when you are reading the instructions for the minigames, they only give you so little time before they say, Bloop, too late, uh, you gotta play the minigame now. That makes no sense whatsoever. Even during the accident minigames that pop up on each board map, you can't hit the pause button. Seriously, there's no pause function for this whole game. That alone is a big red strike for this game, along with all the other BS that happens in it. For God's sakes. Why do I still have you to this day? Ugh. Just 
If you know my pain when it comes to playing this game, ladies and gentlemen, then you understand completely. But seriously, why that blue moon hell would they not put a pause function in this game is beyond me. And for that matter, they only give you so little time to read the instructions for each minigame before all of a sudden they just boot you into the minigame with, without, you know, without exclamation. Seriously. At least in Mario Party, you had plenty of time to read the minigame instructions and how they control, and you even got to got a chance to practice it if you weren't sure about what, what to do. <sighs> Let's just get back to the review already. I'm already angry at this game as it is. Finally, the last mode in this game, if you can call it a mode, is the Sonic Room. And the Sonic Room is the place to go, spend time, and relax with the other Sonic characters as they run around in the background. The only character who really moves around or anything is Sonic as he's sitting at the table. All the other characters show up in the window, basically, and all they really do is move around, play, and play grab ass with each other. <laughs> it's boring at first, but as you play the game, the room will get much livelier apparently and if you beat in the game with specific characters you'll get little figure doll stands of them and the way how to make the room much more livelier is with the rings you've gotten throughout story mode you have to use the rings to buy picture screenshots taken I guess by the developers in order to uh, get specific gimmicks such as playing the mini games or changing the game settings or even for that matter, unlocking a boombox to listen to the game's soundtrack. Which is pretty hit or miss in my opinion. There are some jamming tunes in the music, but we'll get back to that later. Also, it should be noted, to the left of the room are cactuses, which keep track of how many mini events you've played. And to the right is an aquarium, which will keep track of how many mini games you've also played. And above the window is a clock, which just tells the time and nothing more. There is a table in the middle of the room where Sonic is sitting at, and that's how you use that to unlock everything and anything in the Sonic room, basically. Also, it should be noted that after you've cleared a board map in story mode, the rings you've collected will be added to the Sonic bank for the Sonic room, and you can use the rings you've gotten in the Sonic room to buy picture screenshots? Why picture screenshots? Why not just make a little shop where you can buy the uh, mini games and stuff like that, like in Mario Party, or you know, be able to buy the hidden characters and everything like that? But picture screenshots—that makes no sense whatsoever. This game makes no sense whatsoever. It's already a torturing slog of a mess. When it comes to the sound quality of this game, a lot of people never seem to talk about it. And if you haven't noticed by listening, all the Sonic Adventure voice actors have returned to, pro to reprise their roles, basically, and including the late, great Dean Bristow, who, who played Dr. Eggman during the Dreamcast era of Sonic games. Everyone's here except the Knuckles voice actor, Michael McGarhan, sadly, as Ryan Drummond plays both Sonic and Knuckles in this game. And in my opinion, he does a pretty good job as Knuckles. I really like Ryan's portrayal of him. Sound-wise, when it comes to the sound quality, the sound in the game is pretty good. Most of the sound effects sound like they're ripped out of Sonic Adventure, in my honest opinion. And the music is okay. The soundtrack is definitely worth listening to. There are a few tunes you can hum to after a while, but most of the tunes in this game are pretty forgettable, like some of the minigame music. I don't remember some of the songs, but I only remember them because there are so many times where we are playing the board maps or playing specific minigames, they would suddenly pop in my head. Some of the music fits, and some of them does not. If you want my opinion, just look up the soundtrack for yourself and see if it's good or not. Before it slips my mind, let me mention the graphics in this game. The cell shaded graphics in this game are not too bad. In fact, some of them are just downright beautiful. The colors, the frames per second, it's just amazing to look at, especially for some of the board maps when you look at the backgrounds and you look at the scenery, all with their own unique charms. And while I'm on the subject, the water on Emerald Coast looks fabulous. This is how next-gen water should look like in some of these games. The characters also look great too, but the mouth animations could have been done way better than this. Not to mention just looking at them, the mouth animations for Sonic and his friends look downright ugly and just cringeworthy.
I mean, sure, the graphics in this game are very beautiful, especially when it comes to the various mini-games and, of course, the scenery for the backgrounds, but don't get me wrong, what I was looking for was a game with fun gameplay and more added to it. I've learned from past experiences with video games in general that graphics aren't the main factor to a game, and after playing Sonic Shuffle for the bajillionth time, it didn't really change my view on this after all this time. The cell shaded graphics are pretty bold, though I preferred the FMV graphics to the somewhat jagged in-game graphics. The backgrounds are beautiful and colorful as I said before, so that gives it a plus for keeping to the traditional style of the Sonic games, like in Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2. And the backgrounds and the boards are all three-dimensional, and the detail is very, very lovely. But, yeah, basically, in my honest opinion, Sonic Shuffle is indeed one of those dark days of Sonic games when the series started to decline, started to decline in my honest opinion. This game can be fun if you have four people to play with instead of just four cheating, no-nonsense CPU players, but there's too much wrong with this game that really, really hinders it from being a real gem on the Dreamcast collection of games. Seriously, there's too much BS in this game that really hinders it from really being a good Mario Party knockoff. And that is saying a lot. I have had this game since it first came out back then in 2000, and I still own my physical copy, but I don't have my Dreamcast anymore to play with it. And... Maybe it's for the better if I don't play this game anymore. If I could sell this game for a bunch of money, I would do it in a heartbeat because a part of me really, really, really does not want to play this game anymore. And you can already tell from the uh, gameplay footage in the video that I had to, dare I say, use an emulator just to get gameplay footage for this because I wasn't going to get gameplay footage from anyone else or anything without permission, but seriously. <sighs> the fact that the game punishes you for losing the hardest is a real low blow, a total kick in the balls. And at the end of the day, even after beating the game, would you really want to come back to it after all this time? My honest opinion, no. I wouldn't really want to come back to this game after all this time. If you want my honest opinion, ladies and gentlemen, play Mario Party instead. Play Mario Parties 1 through 7 or 1 through 8. And just skip this game altogether. There are better Mario Party variations out there like Crash Bash or uh, Zack and Wee Wee's uh, Adventure, which is a game I'm really looking forward to getting into and everything. But yeah. I cannot really recommend this game. If you're looking to add to your Dreamcast collection, yes, it's Sonic and everything, that's true, but the gameplay is really frustrating. It is a bit more strategic than Mario Party with the card system and the Force Jewel battles and the Precious Stone battles and everything, but the way how the AI can cheat by knowing your cards, or even for that matter, just doing their best to kick the crap out of you during minigames, really hinders this whole entire thing. And the fact that you can't pause while playing the minigames is a huge red flag in my honest opinion. But when it's all said and done, if I could give Sonic Shuffle a score, I would probably give it a 2 out of 5. In the words of Adam Sisler from X-Play, I give this game a 2 out of 5. But, yeah. Anyway, want to know what the ending is for this game? I'm pretty sure you want to know, even after my long rant of how this game is. So, uh, here's the ending, guys. After going through and finishing the riot train, you are then proceeding to the final board map of this game called the 4th Dimension Space. And let me tell you, this board map is very large, disorienting, and topsy-turvy. If you manage to get the last precious stone piece on this board map, then you deserve a medal, because trying to navigate this board map can be a real pain with how you have to go up, down, left, right, all over. Seriously. 
and after you've gotten the last precious stone, you're treated to a cutscene. It seems the Void is now heading to the Temple of Light to shatter the precious stone you've worked so hard to put back together. You have to proceed to the Temple of Light in order to confront Void and put a stop to him once and for all. Everyone ends up confronting Void. Lumina asks why destroy the precious stone, why destroy everyone's dreams? And it seems that if you've been paying attention, it seems like Void wasn't really trying to shatter the precious stone on purpose. He was alone and went to look for the pieces, aka everyone. He was trying to reach out and touch everyone, restore everyone. But every time he tried to reach out and touch everyone, it shattered, aka the precious stone shattering, and everyone ran away. He wanted to be whole again. And if you've been paying attention to the story mode at all with the character interactions and everything, then I think it should be clear exactly who and what Void is exactly and why it was he was trying to do what it is he was trying to do. Sadly, because he feels so lonely, he asks why it is he was born. Why was he born? His dark powers end up consuming him and Void turns into a gigantic monster. Cue the final stage clear minigame on this board map. Everyone has to work together in order to defeat Void who is running amok. In order to do so, you have to drop columns of the Temple of Light onto Void and collect the rings. I don't really know exactly how the rules of this minigame are supposed to play out, whether the player who drops the most columns on Void is supposed to be the winner, or the person who manages to get on top of the final column to drop the final piece onto Void is the winner, but to clear this minigame you have to jump on the glowing pillars to drop the pieces of the Temple of Light on Void. And once uh, you've done that, then I guess whoever wins basically wins the board, the, the board map basically. But whoever wins, you never really know exactly. Void also attacks by slamming the ground with his fists and creating shockwaves, firing a laser that can suck your rings away and stomping down on you or dashing into you. After the boss battle, if you manage to win the minigame, then you automatically get the ending. But if you don't, then you'll see the results screen and see who won overall, which can be a major pain. So if you played through this board map and you ended up losing, you have to start all over on the fourth dimension space. But if you won the game, then the game will automatically present the ending to you. So I guess it's a way of saying, hey, we put you through enough pain, suffering, and torture, so here's the ending for you. <laughs> Even though our heroes manage to defeat Void, the darkness that destroys all dreams, Lumina is saddened that, even though they defeated Void, the light has not returned to the precious stone and that goddess Lumina has not returned. She now feels the imaginary world is finished and the people who once dreamed of the world have completely forgotten about it. But come on, we all know that at this point, that is not true and Sonic and the others assure her that that is not true and that Illumina's wish has completely touched their hearts. Sonic finds a strange black shaped jewel on the ground. This turns out to be Void of all things. He tells Illumina to not forget about him and that Void is anger, sadness, despair, and emptiness, feelings that are necessary for dreams to come true and what makes dreams stronger and why dreams are born. He was probably part of the Precious Stone. It seems that Void was actually a piece of the Precious Stone and he was part of feelings that are necessary for dreams to become real and dreams cannot exist without these feelings as the other characters explain these things. Tails even says that Lumina must accept Void for what he is and that dreams cannot exist without these types of feelings. It's like that one piece of a missing puzzle piece and it's the same with him. When Tails felt down and he felt like he couldn't go on, that's when he knew he had to become stronger and braver in order to make things a reality. After listening to all the other characters explain how dreams can't die or exist without Void's feelings, Lumina thanks the heroes and takes Void's Precious Stone into the Precious Stone itself. Upon doing that, the light of the Precious Stone is finally restored to its original shape and form and the cracks in it are healed. Lumina and Void make up and shake hands and surprise, they actually fuse together and form Lumina of all things. 
With Goddess Illumina finally restored, she thanks the heroes for saving Imaginary World and that now it will be an even better place than it originally was before. She then apologizes to the heroes because she let her dark emotions get the better of her because she was so afraid she wasn't going to make Imaginary World even better than it already was now. And that caused her to separate into Lumina Flowlight and Void. And she also says that we as people must become stronger because even people with the strongest of hearts can have darkest emotions inside them. And the whole moral of the story is, you can't destroy dreams, you must embrace your dreams no matter how small they are, and that your dreams don't betray you when you lose yourself. That's when you lose your dreams. It's not that dreams don't come true, it's just that we as people just give up on them. Emptiness does not conquer dreams. Dreams conquer the emptiness. In fact, this whole ending reminds me of Digimon Season 2 or Digimon Adventure 2's finale where everyone is trying their best to fight Mallow Myotismon and he keeps using the dark spores inside the little kids bodies that are tainted to make himself stronger. But as I said, the moral of the story is, and it's a pretty good one to be honest, that you can't destroy dreams or anything like that. It's just that we as people tend to forget about them or give up on them and that we must embrace them. For dreams conquer emptiness. Emptiness does not conquer dreams. So with that being said, Sonic and friends finally return to their world and that's the end of Sonic Shuffle in a nutshell basically. So yeah, that's basically Sonic Shuffle all in a glorious nutshell. As I said before, this game has too much BS on it that really hinders this game from replay value alone. With the cheating AI that knows exactly what your cards are to them getting the most unbelievable best route to get to the precious stone or even for that matter stockpiling force duels really hinders it, especially when you're playing the mini games. Overall, I can't really say I would enjoy playing this game again, or if anyone would even consider playing this game again. But if you want my honest opinion, as I said before, just play Mario Party or any other uh, party-based game because this game is like a bully. It's basically punishing you and bullying you for no reason except if you're losing. <sighs> And the fact that I still own a physical copy of this game just makes me ask the question of why. Is it a guilty pleasure? Well, yeah, I consider it a guilty pleasure. But if you guys want my honest opinion, don't bother with Sonic Shuffle. In fact, I probably just ignore it in general. So, yeah. And uh, as for unlockable stuff, well, I'm not even going to bother. But I will say this much, if you are interested, you can unlock Supersonic, Big the Cat, E-102 Gamma, or even a Chow to play through in Versus Mode. But with how BS Versus Mode is, I wouldn't consider playing it with alone. Get some friends if you really want to play this game, because playing with the CPU is not fun. In fact, it's borderline bull. It's a pain. So yeah, with that being said, I'm Leo Hightower. Thank you guys for watching my honest, uh, truthful review of Sonic Shuffle in a nutshell. And until we meet again, I hope to see you in the next video project. Until then, peace out guys, and keep on gaming.